take take over the admitting people in. Yeah, that works. Got it. Cool. Awesome. Well, thank you for the intro. Uh, let me get my PowerPoint shared. So, where are we here? You should be seeing a desktop. Do you see my PowerPoint deck? We do. Awesome. All yeah, right. So, um, as I go through this, uh, if you have questions, go ahead and throw them into the the chat, or um, you know, come off mute and go ahead and ask. Um, I'm going to assume that people know at least the basics of what uh, story mapping is, user story mapping, um, and and I'm hoping we can kind of get through the the ideas um, relatively quickly and then have some time for some discussion and questions and whatnot. So that's the intent. We'll see. Uh, we'll see how we do. Uh, as a as a project manager, I, I recently started working with said to me, uh, "You're not very good with time, are you?" <laughs> So it's, I'm challenged with linear things like time and math. Anyway, um, this is me. Uh, I'd like to say I bring people together to solve complex problems. I do that um, individually with teams, with organizations. I do that across a variety of modalities, coaching, speaking, advising, mentoring, training, uh, writing stuff, uh, giving talks. Um, been around, as Jamie said, for a while. I was a, joined my first scrum team as a developer like 15 years ago, um, and before that was a developer, uh, independent developer, and um, uh, outdoor professional outdoor guy before that. So been doing a bunch of stuff. Uh, we can talk about any of that uh, if it's relevant or interesting. Um, I do do live in uh, the states here, upper New England, so far northeast corner, almost to Canada, uh, in Maine, um, with my family and our animals and my mountain bike and whatnot. So uh, let's see here. So what are we, you know, I, I, we, we're never really <laughs> inventing too much new ideas. We, we, we are working with stuff other people have sort of brought into the world. So Jeff Patton's uh, user story mapping is sort of the definitive book in the space. Um, as he says, <laughs> he, he didn't invent this stuff either. He just sold the most books. So he gets to call, uh, make the names up for what stuff is. Um, it's a great book. It's still very relevant. Um, Melissa Perry's Escaping the Build Trap is a little more recent. Uh, also exceptional for anyone who's kind of curious what does product leadership or management look like, um, especially beyond uh, the product owner role in a scrum team. Like what is this at the enterprise, uh, this kind of product leadership or management look like? Uh, Alistair Coburn's Walking Skeleton is a really powerful pattern of slicing out a, a very thin, fully functioning, um, releasable piece of software, at least releasable internally. Seems like my slide deck is frozen a little bit. Uh, Bob Martin's Clean Code, exceptional book about, uh, certainly about object-oriented development, though many of the principles out of object-oriented development also apply, I think, to really, really, really well to stories and story mapping. Um, particularly single responsibility. So having a sense of what that is. And Goiko Ajic's uh, specification by example, um, which is sort of a, a reference guide for getting started with and uh, creating um, documentation that is consumable and directly exercises underlying code. Um, it's a really, really powerful uh, kind of concept and paradigm and user story mapping is for me, the, the most powerful way to get started um, with identifying how do we how do we start writing these specifications? So these are all exceptional books to have in your library if you're curious about this kind of stuff. And uh, I can also make these slides available if anyone um, is interested. So why do we do this? Why bother with story mapping in the first place? Um, I think it's a, a great way to exercise and express that first value of the Manifesto for Agile software development, which is individuals and interactions over processes and tools. The process of story mapping and the tooling around it is really, really simple and straightforward. It's easy to pick up. It's easy to do a, a pretty good job with it um, right out of the gate with a little bit of a uh, few pointers, like, um, like I'll give you in this uh, conversation, or you can come to, I've had people come to a workshop and be able to go 
uh, lead these and have them go pretty darn well. Um, the reasons to do a story map is, uh, in my opinion, at least what I found is that it mitigates risks, particularly as we do complex things. So the, one of the big risks in high complexity uh, of product development certainly is just building the wrong thing. And by the wrong thing, I mean, it doesn't actually meet somebody's need. Um, nobody uses it. Um, they use it, but it doesn't do the right thing or it misses the mark for them. Uh, so that's a huge risk and story mapping can help us mitigate that risk. Um, it can uh, increase the quality of feedback loops and inspection points. If those are poor or, or very long, uh, we introduce risk. Um, one of the big questions that I am uh, often asked and Scrum does not do a very good job of answering is when might it be done? Can we fit this thing? We have this much money and we have this much time. Can we fit uh, this delivery into that uh, constraint? Story mapping will not tell you for sure, but it can help you have a better idea of it. Sometimes we couple different kinds of risks into large batches, um, so it can help us un undo that. Um, does uh, several other things. And if we're gonna really benefit from story mapping, I think we have to start thinking more like designers. And this is what Goiko Adjic has to say about uh, how a designer approach is a problem. I'll just let it uh, play out here. So this idea of understanding the problem deeply and understanding who it's for is going to inform the first uh, piece of sort of the first idea I'm going to give you. Um, and it kind of is a, a thread that weaves through all of them. So again, uh, you know, if we're just trying to document requirements, um, we've already, we're on the, the wrong path. That is, you certainly could use story mapping to um, just document a set of requirements. Um, I think it's much more powerful to drive a deeper conversation about what real problems and real goals and real users uh, do we have? And, and what are we really gonna do um, to help them? What are we really gonna do to change their world? And I think that's a, a different way to approach this. Um, story mapping is a piece of a very large puzzle. This comes from a colleague of mine, uh, Pete Anderson. He calls us the product owner of product development toolkit. Um, and here's story mapping right in the middle. So. I think it's important to understand it's not it's not the only thing you would do um, and I have found uh, the hard way that in order to get a story mapping session started well and have it be really effective there are certain things you need to have um, this is an old uh, far side cartoon uh, which might not make as much sense for those who are not uh, in the American context um, anyway baby is used uh, to refer to lots of things besides literal babies, which is why it's kind of a funny cartoon. Anyway, so if you don't have a clear test and strategic direction and goals, i.e. why are you doing this, um, it is very likely that story mapping will very quickly reveal that you don't have that. Likewise, if you don't understand deeply who you are building this for, it is very likely that a story mapping session will reveal that very quickly. Um, if you don't know the boundaries of the effort, like where does it start and where does it end? Um, story mapping will, will start revealing that and, and, it, and the focus will um, kind of bleed out into a lot of what about and what if questions. So making sure we understand what are the boundaries and making sure the right people are in the room. Um, I like to defer to inclusion on this. Um, I like to work with whole systems rather than small parts. Uh, complex problems are not solved by breaking them into lots of little pieces and then putting those little pieces back together. Uh, they are solved by um, kind of creating a, a, a functional chunk of something that works that's valuable and then deploying that and seeing what feedback comes back. 
and then inspecting and adapting against that thing. So having the right people there is really, really important. All right, so here's what we are going to be uh, talking about. Confusion on who and why, we're, who we're doing this for, why are we doing it? Uh, what we call avoiding the build trap, to use Melissa Perry's language. Sometimes uh, we get confused about what is needed versus how it will be done. And I use the example, I used to travel a lot on planes and um, finding a flight is different than searching for a flight. And that language is very subtle maybe, uh, but it's very profound because as soon as we say searching for a flight, now we've, we've kind of locked into a certain implementation versus finding a flight creates possibilities um, across a lot of different implementations that we can then unpack and uh, negotiate and make trade-off decisions around. Sometimes we introduce variab variability or variation uh, too fast and too early into our development processes. And um, we kind of get ahead of ourselves a little bit and end up slowing ourselves down. So figuring out some um, good ways to talk about how do you slice out releases? How do you slice out um, chunks of functionality that can deliver value that you can get feedback on? Um, for a while, we've had this concept called the MVP or minimum viable product. Uh, I, I don't like that term anymore because it's just gotten so overloaded. And usually when I say it, um, it just confuses things because people all think of, have a different definition about it. Um, and so I'd suggest we move away from that and move away to more specific uh, things. So let's see what we can do about this. So first, um, who is this for? And why do they care? Why are we building whatever we're building? It could be a digital product. It could be a physical product. Um, it could be like in my case, I my products are things like talks and workshops. Um, they're things like pieces of writing that I put into the world. So who are we doing this for? And why, why do they care? What's their pain? What's their gain? What will they benefit from this? And is the user or the person who will benefit the same as the chooser? We, we, don't, we don't know sometimes. Um, and again, if we don't know these things, uh, we're gonna find out that we don't know them. And when you kind of set up a story mapping session and you got a bunch of people showing up and you got all your tooling set up, uh, especially in the pre-COVID days when everyone's flying in uh, to do one of these things when we didn't have uh, really good digital tools yet. Um, it was a real drag. It was a real bummer to realize that we don't actually understand who this is for and that we can do something together, but it's not really the highest, uh, the highest value thing. So for example, uh, at one of my engagements several years ago now, I was invited to help uh, kind of kick off this multi-year program. The program had been, it was kind of being managed as a traditional uh, project, uh, like project management project. So it had its phases and we are now in the, in the build phase. And so in the build phase, they brought together a bunch of people, you know, over hundred uh, team members and then a bunch of uh, supporting teams to finally build this thing. And uh, one of the teams, it, it's, a, it's a very data heavy, product, a very internally uh, used product. And so these teams are kind of responsible for sections of this massive data pipeline. And they show up and they say, well, uh, and I start asking, well, who's this for? And they say, don't worry, uh, this is, there's no users of this, this part of the system. It's just data. We're just moving data from place to place and doing things to it as we move it around. Uh, but there's, there's only uh, system components. There's no people. Well, it turned out that we started asking questions about what was important about that data. And ultimately, at some point, it, it pops up and human beings use it. And they even knew who those people were in the organization. But then when I asked, can we go talk to them? Like, are they in this building? Because it's this big corporate building. Um, they're like, no, 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 we can't. We can't take time to do that. And so instead, we kind of took our best guesses and I 
it was it was kind of it was a drag like we knew it wasn't the right thing to do um another story of that is or, or sort of the flip side of that um uh, was a another effort at the same company that had been using some personas they, they had been doing some sort of protected experiments around working more uh, in more agile ways and so they had done a bunch of persona workshops and, and used these personas up and uh at one point i had the product owner who was responsible for that in one of my workshops and this guy's you know like a, a finance guy he came out of finance and um so really structured way of thinking very pragmatic and i was kind of curious what he thought of personas um because they can be a little bit um ambiguous or or a little bit uh they they require some um imagination and some empathy and so i asked him i said uh you know ben you probably know more about this than i do at this point um what do you think about personas and he just said you know every fiber of my logical mind wants to think they're silly um but every fiber of my being that has used them knows otherwise and they uh they guide our my thinking we talk about them as though they're real people um and they're enabling us to build a better product so that was uh that was a pretty cool way for that group to bring in to the room and their conversation um who are those people that will use this product what are they going to uh, benefit and what pains are we going to solve for them uh, the slide that's up is some stuff uh, that I'm working on right now. Um, the yellow cards on the left are some needs. These are all just user stories that I wrote uh, last week. Um, I work with the state of Maine, and part of that work is to uh, help make equitable education opportunities in the public school system. And one of the ways we want to make those equitable opportunities is regardless of economic status, um, you you should be able to get uh, a, a great education and it should be a level playing field. And so a child in Maine with less economic access is never going to use the system. They're, they're, they won't even know it exists. Uh, ideally, we will just enable them to have a better educational experience. I think that's really important. I think it's really amazing to bring that in and remind people this is really why we're doing this. Uh, this has nothing to do with geocoding addresses. This has to do with equi uh, making equitable uh, educational opportunities available to everyone in the state. That's a pretty big game. Um, there's several other users that would benefit from the system. Some of them would use the system. Some of them would not use the system. Um, some of them would consume data that comes out of it. Again, it's it's multifaceted. So understand who is it for. So what are some things you can do? Find out who will be using your product. What are their pains? What are their gains? And go talk to them. Even better, invite them into your mapping session. See if you can reduce the distance that the teams, the implementation folks have between themselves and the people who do use the system or the customers who benefit from it. And there can be lots of ways to do that. Um, I've issued that challenge to a couple of the teams I'm coaching right now. Uh, go figure out, like you can, it's, it's COVID days. You can't just go visit a client site. How else for uh, not a lot of time and money investment might you get closer to the people using your stuff? Um, and they have a bunch of ideas about that. Deploy probes to buy information and reduce uncertainty. So a probe in this case might be um, something like uh, an email. It could be a phone call. It could be a, a focus group. It could be even a survey. It could be something like, um, like when I have a new workshop, for example, or an idea for a workshop, I will kind of, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell the, my, my different uh, strategic partners, hey, I've got this new thing. Um, I'll maybe make a, a, a white paper about it or, or a write up about it. I'll put it up on my website and, and I'll schedule it and I'll see what happens. And very often, like I don't, nothing happens. Great. I didn't really spend any time or money on that. Um, and then when the things do uh, 
get interest, then I can build the workshop. Same thing with conference talks. You know, if it gets accepted, then you build the, the talk. If it doesn't get accepted, you haven't um, uh, spent your money. So those are different kinds of probes. And finally, um, use personas. They're really powerful tools. They can be very lightweight, like this one up on the screen. It's just asking, um, you know, what are the needs and pain points? Uh, what are the demographics and psychographic details of this person? Like kind of where are they coming from? What's their level of technical aptitude? Uh, what's their level of training? Um, how curious are they? Do they want to be a part of early product development and discovery? Or do they just want a really stable thing that will work reliably? Um, what about all that? Who are these people? And what are the behaviors and actions that we can expect from them? And what might we be um, interested in, in finding out about and measuring? So I think we've had, had some conversation and chat around the, the graphic on the right. Um, mm -hmm. Is it possible to make that bigger or, or speak more directly to, to what you have there? It looks like an entity map, perhaps, but... Uh, yeah, it's just a, yeah, it's a, it's a persona template out of Mural. And I, and I uh, okay. popped that open and I said, hey, that looks, um, that looks pretty good. Um, again, I'm, I'm, you, can, you can go as deep and crazy as you want with personas. And I've seen some really, really detailed ones um, that are hanging on walls that nobody ever looks at and that I never hear anybody refer to. And it's like, wow, that's unfortunate versus something like this where we didn't need a lot of detail because we had a really powerful conversation um, that drove when we created a bunch of these uh, for this new data system that we're building. Um, and at the end of the conversation, the top manager in the room, you know, and I kind of asked for feedback, like, how'd this go? Uh, she said, this was amazing because we don't usually do this at the beginning. We do this usually at the end after we've run out of time. And so just asking some of these really high level questions about who these people are, what do they need? Uh, what are their pains? What are their gains? Now, do they have a choice in buying this system or are they like in the state government context? It's like, here's the software. You have to use it regardless of how horrible or great it is. Um, so what, what are you trying to solve for? And, uh, and, and how well trained are you to solve that? Because oftentimes the people that you build the system for aren't the ones that actually get to use it. It gets used by a, a secretary or an admin assistant who doesn't have the training um, in that domain. Um, are we still making it easier for that person to do their job? So again, like it's it's about the conversation, right? What's the what's the lightest for me at least? What's the lightest, um, most valuable way that you can approach that conversation? Um, and don't necessarily worry about it being amazingly beautiful and and really detailed. And you know, you know, it's like don't get distracted by the the tool. Use the tool to build your understanding. And and less is often more there. Any other thoughts on that? Questions? And uh, Jamie, if you could kind of keep an eye on the chat for me, if anyone asks questions there, just jump in and, and let me know. Um, all right, so what's the next thing? And my, my cat has, has joined me. This is, this is uh, one of my said animals is Ferrari. So she likes to come hang out when, uh, when I'm on calls. So you might see your tail kind of flip up. Anyway, so. We, we did have someone ask how, how large should oh. the user be? How large the user base uh, um, should be represented by each persona? Oh, uh, I've, I'm going to be a good consultant and say it depends. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it could be that you have really critical, uh, like your administrators might be a very small user base, but a very, very critical one. Um, likewise, you might have a very large user base of people who aren't that valuable uh, to the core goals of the software application. Um, and it could be that you don't know yet how, how valuable one specific uh, segment is over another until you run some probes. Uh, so like a, a, a insurance company I was working with, um, they were trying to get um, people to buy insurance policies online. And um, it turned out that, that they could see that people were starting to get a, a quote, but then they were not finishing the quoting process and they didn't understand why. So they asked the team to go improve that metric, um, you know, get people through so we can 
get them a quote so then we can they can decide whether or not um, they want to buy the, the policy. We didn't know who this was for. And so we had to deploy some probes. Um, and the, the BA on that team had access to personas and market research. And so she was able to say, um, we've got these kind of three, three segments of, of potential customer. Um, and we were able to do, uh, design some very lightweight uh, experiments that were transparent to them around um, sort of what we call trap doors, right? So they, they click on something and we measure their click and then it goes through to what, what they're um, wanting to see, in this case, starting the quote process. And so we have three different trap doors. They all go to the same place and we measure which one do people go through. We don't know which one's the most important. In this case, um, it turned out people wanted to buy, um, the price was the most important uh, component of shopping for insurance in this channel. And now we have the data that that particular user base is the one that matters now. It's it's we can kind of put the other ones aside for now. Um, I don't know how many people uh, were in that particular um, segment, but I do know I bumped into an agile coach that worked at that organization still five years later. And he said, oh, yeah, that um, he said I was always wondering who who helped that uh, that quoting process because it doubled the um, the conversion rate. Five years later, it was still twice as high as they had been earlier. And it was just, you know, it's just making the company money and it's getting people the product that they want uh, all by itself. It's all totally automated. All right. Um, should your personas be a real representative person or generalization of a type? Um, either or, I mean, usually I, I think uh, I use a generalization of a type like this one is a role uh, you know, school district business manager. There's lots of those um, around. Um, maybe one of them's even named Donna. I don't know. Um, but um, yeah, again, it's 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 think like a designer. <laughs> Get below the pro go deeper into the problem of what are we trying to solve for. Like the persona is not the solution. It's just a tool, and ask like what's the what's the you know kind of take a sort of a, a lean approach what's the minimum value that we can create with this persona to help us make a better decision and then do that and experiment with it and iterate on it if you find that it doesn't give you the information you need make it better if you feel, find that it's overwhelming and it's just hanging on the wall and nobody's using it check into that okay so this is um this word requirement drives me crazy um it's it's a it's in 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 high complexity situations we simply don't know. You don't know what is required. You have to go find that out, and you discover what is required through doing the work. However, there are some things that are required. Um, think of a stool. A stool it is required to have legs. I mean, there are one-legged stools which are like a monopod with a seat on it. Um, I'm not a huge fan of those myself. I like stools that have at least three legs. Uh, those are requirements if you're going to have a stool. And like giving somebody a, an MVP of a stool that just has a seat that's on the ground um, is probably not going to get you the kind of market feedback you want. And it's probably not going to give them the impression of what you're trying to do. However, if you have the form factor of a stool, the materials and finish and, and specific designs are all options. Right? Does it, what, what's it made out of? How, what's the finish? Is it painted? Is it stained? Is it polished metal? Does it have a back? Uh, does it have a cushion? Is the back curved? Is it flat? Is it slats? Like all of that stuff can be negotiated with trade-offs. None of it is required. But parts of it are. And, and learn from a designer's mindset to differentiate and pull apart What's a requirement and what's a negotiable implementation option? Cars need to have wheels. The size of the wheel and the material of the rim and the kind of tire is all going to vary greatly depending on what kind of vehicle it is and what's it going to be used for and who's going to be driving it and how much do they want to pay for it and how much do they want to uh, pay to, to own it. All of that is really critical. You have to understand who is this for, why are they buying it, in order to start pulling apart what's required and what's optional. 
if I say something like, hey, I'm going to tell you about this awesome new social media platform and we're going to build it. And this is like in the, you know, rewind, you know, eight years or so ago. And we're going to call it Instagram. And it's just it's going to be this amazing new thing. Um, but uh, as we're building it, we're running out of time. So we have to cut scope. Let's do Instagram, but without the photos. Photos are hard and they take a lot of server space and they're hard to move around. So we'll launch Instagram without the photos. Like you don't have Instagram now. It's a requirement. You have to have photos. It's a photo sharing platform. Um, how does this matter in, in uh, application development? So the, the uh, image that's up right now, this is way back um, when, uh, this is a Google drawing of all things. We were doing story mapping as a virtual group or virtual team. So we had to figure out how to do this uh, visual stuff before we had fancy whiteboard tools like Mural or anything like that. And so we use Google drawing and we were trying to figure out uh, how can we in a content moderation tool uh, that was moderating social media posts across a variety of platforms, we were working on uh, integrating Twitter. Um, we wanted to be able to have a moderator through our tool uh, have a direct message conversation with a Twitter uh, author, author of a tweet. And it turns out um, that Twitter has this whole sort of weird business logic around, um, you know, are you following them? Are they following you, et cetera, et cetera, before you can issue a direct message. And so we had done all of this, uh, all of this planning around trying to figure this out and all of this research spikes and all of this, can we do it? Um, and I don't think anybody had really asked the question, do we need to do this? Can we just put a link that says DM or send a message and see if anyone actually clicks it? I don't know that we had that, that kind of a probe going out. And so we were really confused about how much work we had to do to make this thing function versus what's just a little thing that we could a probe we could put out uh, into our, our ecosystem to see what happens. Another uh, thing you can do with this is um, imagine what you would do with your product if you suddenly had to do it in one tenth of the time. Uh, I just worked with a, um, I was brought in to help sort of write <laughs> an effort a, a new uh, a grant funded project that had kind of gone off the rails a little bit. They'd done a bunch of design thinking. They, had, um, you know, kind of said they were going to build this thing. Um, they had already issued some grants to uh, some folks. And part of the grant was to capture learnings. And this tool was supposed to be capturing the learnings and the learnings were, were being uh, learned right now. And so they had all these ideas about what they needed to do uh, to make this tool work. And really what they needed to do was have a, a very small group of people in the field, have an account, be able to log in, be able to create a learning, and then have other people in the field be able to comment on that learning. And that's it. They didn't need user administration. They didn't need um, curation. They didn't need a whole lot of anything. And ultimately they will need all that stuff, but right now they need a release that enables uh, a manual creation of a user account in the system, that person to be able to come log in with those credentials, create a post or comment on another post. That is the slice. And they would never have identified that without the time pressure that they found themselves in. So as a thought experiment, you can just say, what if we had to do this in one tenth of the time? What might that happen? So things you can do in addition to that, uh, keep your implementation details out of what we call the backbone of your your story map um so the story map let's see here i'm gonna i'm gonna forward the slide deck one here just to show you what i mean by the backbone so the backbone are these big stories across the top in this case they're the blue cards and then there's like a bigger story above them so that's your backbone those are your requirements they're outcomes they're not outputs there are things like, I need to find a flight. I need to create a post. I need to create a new message. How you do that is going to be 
a negotiable conversation because there's probably there ought to be lots of ways right i need legs on the stool okay we, we can do that in many ways we'll create a bunch of different possibilities below that i need wheels on a car we've got lots of possibilities put those below that so understand what's a means what's an end put them in the proper places of your story map if you're not sure where they go ask what happens if we don't have this if the whole thing falls over like a stool without legs then it's probably a requirement if the thing can stand up like a stool and we're trying to figure out should it be a metal leg or a wooden leg it probably is not part of the backbone it is not a requirement it's an optional implementation uh, detail and learn to unpack uh sorry learn to unpack the um got my slide deck all messed up here the functional or uh, non-functional or vague needs so things like hey i need it to be easier i need it to be faster i need it to be more scalable more secure etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, understand what the differences are of those things all right uh, idea number three, strongly control variability. This one is perhaps a little more um, abstract. If we, let me, let me, let me ask a question. So if, if, if someone is say like, a, you would like to eat, you're a human being and you're hungry. And so you're, you're like a business person or a user who has this problem of being hungry. And I'm going to help you solve that problem as like a, an implementation person or a technical person. And I say to you, um, cool, I can solve that problem for you. I'm going to take you to like a buffet um, and we're going to go on Monday and then we'll go again a week later. Uh, you're likely to stuff as much food in your pockets as you possibly can if that's the only time you're going to eat in a week versus i say um, hey i'm going to solve your problem today on monday um, and, and tell you what why don't you just eat enough for today and then we'll come back tomorrow and we'll keep coming back every single day and you can eat um, smaller amounts you don't have to worry about uh, stuffing your pockets with stuff Iterative, uh, iteratively building things is important. And a lot of, especially traditional shops, they're not used to that. And so they want to um, put lots of stuff into every single release because they're afraid they're never going to get another one. And so if we can help break that down into um, smaller chunks and only add variability in as we demonstrate things and get feedback on it, it's uh, a better bet. It's a better way to get um, to to uh, to get stuff done, shall we say? So how how might you do that? Or what are some ideas about that? There's a pattern uh, called interface first development. Um, so that's understanding uh, and and specifying first where are the seams between things, like where are the interaction points or the interfaces. Um, those might be really formal interfaces like a, like an API. Uh, that might be a less formal interface like a handoff between two groups or something like this. Um, design those first. Uh, I had uh, a group, they were building a, an insurance product. Uh, they're a distributed team. So some of them were in Ireland, some of them were in the States. And so the, we were doing this sort of virtual uh, um, collaboration planning thing around their next uh, big effort and they had already impact mapped it and so they had invited me in like hey how how can we um how can we kind of tackle this thing what what ideas do you have and so i had asked them well have you heard of the walking skeleton pattern they said no that's never heard of it like what's that and i said well walking skeleton is a way to uh understand that your your value is created on a story map at, at the far right. So, if, you know, again, if we're mapping like a social media post or something like that, um, when the post goes up and, and, and can be interacted with is when it is valuable. Uh, an email is valuable when it's sent. 
And, and so getting to that delivery point is, is critical. How do we get there really, really quickly? How do we flush out assumptions? How do we flush out risks? And so if you, at least in the software context, hard code, you know, you build the scaffolding, which is the skeleton and hard code things instead of uh, having variability like, oh, I'm going to take a user input here, or I'm going to go get this out of a database or some other persistence layer, or we're going to, uh, you know, take these various inputs and do some business logic to apply to them and figure out like a spell check, um, you know, what, what matches, what doesn't match. Iron all that out, like remove that out from this walking skeleton slice and just hard code it and demonstrate that you can do it. Um, just looking at time here. So uh, one example of this, uh, I was working with another team and they had asked me, they invited me to come to a backlog refinement. It's like, cool. And just observe, like they, they just sort of an open-ended question, you know, just what do you notice? How can we get better? How can we improve? And they were uh, working on a mobile app that would interface with uh, on the back end, um, uh, an AI, an artificial intelligence platform, um, to do some some business problems, uh, solve some business problems, and then send back a response. Nobody knew if the if AI is brand new; it's in development right now, right? As they're building the mobile app, the back end is is being built, and so nobody knew really if it would work. And and as they're talking about the backlog refinement, they're talking about things like, what, do, what does the app do if, this, if the uh, network is down? What does the app do if uh, the person can't log in? What is like all of these problems that they already know how to solve, they've already solved them a bunch of times for other mobile apps. Um, that's not where the risk is, right? And so I just ask them, where's the risk for you in this effort? Like what's the only thing that matters for you in this mobile app right now, in this moment? And it's like, well, does that AI work, right? Okay, cool. So you know what you're going to send to the AI. You have concrete examples. You have files, right, that you can send to this thing that it's going to evaluate. Hard code a call that sends those files and gets the responses and compare uh, the responses to the actual expectations that you would have and see, do, do they match? And if they match, you've got a pretty good uh, sense that this app could work. And if they don't match, you got a much bigger problem. Stop writing things about authentication and network failures, because that doesn't matter if this fundamental business problem can't be solved the way that you think you're going to solve it. Right? Slice out that variability and isolate it and, and, um, and mitigate it. Same thing with first version of the iPhone. You know, I've got like, geez, what is this? It's version 12 now. <laughs> I've got an 11. But way back when, when the first iPhone came out, um, it was really novel because it didn't have a keyboard and it didn't have a, 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 you know, a number pad. And that was the, the variability. That was the thing that jobs wanted to prove that we can do a touch keyboard and people will like it and people will use it and they will use it and like it so much that the phone itself can kind of suck and it doesn't have to work very well. And it doesn't have to have as many apps and as many features as the competitors because we're trying to prove something else. Right. And they, and they eliminated all of the variability uh, that would have delayed and made that uh, project bigger and more complex. So things to do, understand what do we need to learn next? And that's a question I get from Jeff Patton. Um, he's, he has uh, asked it many, many times. <laughs> what's the next thing we need to learn? And what's a good way to uh, what's a good probe to learn it? Uh, Melissa Perry talks about like a concierge pattern, which is there's no automation at all. A request comes in, I manually, we have people that take that request, fulfill that request manually and send out the thing. And if we get enough of those requests and it makes sense to automate it, we will then automate it. Uh, a Wizard of Oz, which is similar to, to concierge, you kind of have the, the person behind the curtain. Um, Concierge, it's it's clear that uh, somebody's actually doing this manually, and, and Wizard of Oz, maybe you're, you're obfuscating that a little bit and hiding it a little bit. Um, you could do technical spikes. You could do prototypes, like um, 
had a had a, a group who was in Boston. The office was right on Boston Common, and they would um, draw pictures of interfaces of possible interfaces and, and different screens that would click through. And they would walk out into the Boston Common, which is this great big public park right in the middle of uh, Back Bay, Boston. And and they would just ask people, hey, I work for this company, and and could I talk to you for a minute? And what would you think of this? And they would kind of hold up the thing, and and if you click here, what would you expect to have happen? And and so it's really cheap, fast, quick way to get high quality feedback. And understand that that we're gonna iterate. Right, the the first releases might only be internal. They might be to learn. They might be to mitigate risk. Um, they're answering the question, what do we need to learn next? Right, and keep them as low variability as you can to lower risk and increase your delivery speeds. You want to get your end to end functionality first. How do you do that? You define your you start with your interfaces, your seams, your abstractions, specify those first and hard code um, transactions between them. Find what are the most risky things that we've got. Right? Those are often the things that people actually don't want to talk about or look at because they're scary and there's lots of uncertainty. And if they're not valid and we find that out right at the beginning, what does that mean for our jobs? And do we still have roles and, and what's going to happen? And so maybe we should just solve a bunch of the easy stuff first to like kind of get a track record of success before we blow the whole thing up. Um, whatever those dynamics are from from sort of a, a business agility perspective, we want to know the truth very, very quickly so we can make those hard decisions and pivot uh, while we still have time and money. So identify and solve for those highest risks first. Get things that are stable, technologically stable, like build solid product and then iterate it and increment it. And be very, very wary of the bets and the commitments that are being made about this product. Who are we making promises to? Can we fulfill those promises? Are we making promises that are absolute versus a probabilistic range? When we're in high complexity, it's like, you know, if you're gonna ask a poker player before they sit down to play a hand, are you gonna win or not? They're not gonna be able to answer that question. They will be able to say, well, right now I have this probability based on my uh, past performance. And as this game proceeds and information reveals itself, that probability will go up or down and I will uh, manage the commitments and bets that I make according to the risks that I'm encountering. I think it's a really good model for product development. Story mapping can help us do that. All right, so I know we're pretty much out of time. I did not see a, a huge amount of questions come in. So um, maybe I'll do uh, one slide. I'll, I'll jump to this next slide first, and then we'll uh, hang out. I, I can spend a few minutes hanging out um, if, if anyone wants to stick around and, and have a chat. Uh, but if you want to learn more, um, I am doing a user story mapping deep dive workshop November 15th to the 19th. It's totally online. Um, it's with Adventures with Agile out of uh, London. We're doing it in a time zone that we're hoping will uh, work for a lot of different folks. Um, there's the URL for that. Um, I've got a free visual guide to user story mapping. Um, it's available here at this URL. Uh, you can reach out to me via email, set up some time to chat. Always happy to, to meet strangers. Uh, you can connect with me on LinkedIn and uh, love to, to meet folks there as well. So um, thanks for having me. And what last questions do folks have? Uh, the, the presentation's officially over. So um, I'll, I'll hang out until everybody leaves, I guess. <laughs> Uh, go eat a donut. Kevin, we, 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 <laughs> we really appreciate you coming and joining us today. Uh, Thanks. It, it was, uh, I learned a lot. This was, this was excellent. So if anyone has any questions, we, you know, use this time. This is awesome. We have, yeah, we have Kevin all off. to ourselves. Yeah, come off mute. Turn on your video. I'll stop the screen share so we can see everybody again. Uh, yeah, what's going on? What do we got? It's been a slice. <laughs> what is your biggest challenge to making this work? Um, 
I can certainly answer that, take a stab at answering that. Uh, the biggest challenge to making this work is fundamentally that people don't understand complexity very well. And what I mean by that is they believe that they know the, what the solution is before they've built anything. And they have made that commitment and they've made that bet. And it is a real, real drag and sad wake up when they have spent their time and money or they've made commitments to spend that time and money and they learn uh, that it's not the right thing or they learn they can't do it in time. And so helping people to understand complexity and complexity theory, and instead of thinking in terms of a single future to think in terms of multiple futures, like with scenarios, uh, smart scenario based planning or um, options theory, there's a great uh, graphic novel called commitment um, that uh, kind of introduces scenarios and, and options theory in a really accessible way. Uh, it's really an awesome little book. Um, go go pick it up if that's if you're curious about that. Um, but again, that's the biggest challenge I have. If, if we understand complexity, we understand that there's no one future that we can say that's going to come true. Um, now we can uh, have the the space to do some really innovative problem solving. Um, what do I think about BDD with user stories? I love it. Um, I think uh, behavior driven development is amazing. Specification by example is. Um, you know, there's sort of several different flavors of, of like acceptance test driven development or, uh, you know, behavior driven development or a specification by example. I think it's great. The, the thing that I really struggled with when I first started uh, trying to work with a technical team around BDD was, was what do you describe from a behavioral perspective in your feature file? And then how do you describe the scenarios? Um, this is assuming we're using a, a tool like Cucumber or the Gherkin uh, language. And user story mapping answers that question for you, which is one of the reasons I'm so excited about it. Uh, I have a, a different presentation called From Concept to Code, where I illustrate how we, uh, with a software team, uh, went from a really big idea, we story mapped it, uh, we converted those uh, that backbone and those ribs into feature files. Uh, we map those feature files into code uh, do, using um, test-driven development and then uh, C-sharp. This was a .NET stack. Um, really nice, well-factored, uh, high-quality code. And it was like right the first time. It was amazing. It was really, really cool. So I think it works incredibly, incredibly well. Uh, how to pull them up from solutioning. Um, one of my favorite questions is, um, is that the most important thing we need to be talking about right now? And if they say yes, okay, how long would you like to spend talking about it? And if they say, we just wanna spend five minutes or a few minutes, okay, cool, is it okay if I set a timer? And then we'll pop back up. And usually that works really well. We need people to, um, when you have technical people in the room, they're going to want to uh, think about technical implementation and, and think about technical constraints. And I like that. I think that's a good thing. I think it's a, not a good thing if they get stuck in it. Um, in the Poppendeeks, Mary and Tom, uh, oh, is it Tom Poppendeek? And they're, they're big uh, kind of innovators in lean software development. They talk about going down and then coming up and going down and coming up. Like you have to come back out of solutioning and back up into the problem space. Uh, and, and as a good facilitator, you can just ask, hey, well, what do we need to do right now? Um, I watched a very senior developer at one point, she had a binder of technical documentation and she starts digging into her binder, you know, one of the most senior people in the room. And I go, hey, um, looks like you're about to go real deep right now. And she's like, oh yeah. I go, is that, is that what we really need to talk about? And she goes, I don't think so. Yeah, she closed your binder and we're back. Right All right. Uh, the book title is called Commitment. Oh, One moment. I'll run back here and grab. It looks yeah. like this. Okay, it's got dice on the front right. uh, by Master, yeah. Mats, and Geary. Um, again, it's a graphic novel. That means it's a comic book for grownups. Um, it's really cool. It's really well written. It's really well drawn. Um, it's it's kind of a I, I I couldn't put it down. I started reading it and I I just read the whole thing uh, cover to cover. 
Um, let's see here. What else we got? How do you go about estimating user stories for the first time? So that is opening up a huge can of worms. Um, the short answer is I don't. I don't like to estimate things. Um, there's a bunch of reasons and good theory behind why not. Um, what I would say is ask what job are we having this thing do for us and write down the answers. And that's called the jobs to be done um, approach to, to planning. Um, ask questions like, okay, we need to get an email sent. What would need to be true to get that email sent? What would have to happen? And write those things down. Break things apart into small, valuable chunks of work and then begin delivering them. And once you've started delivering them, um, measure how long it tends to take you to deliver them. Uh, that's called cycle time or lead time, depending on which way you look at it and start um, building some metrics off of that growing data set and start forecasting off those metrics. And what you're going to find is the variability in those lead times is kind of weird and it's kind of crazy. And um, it doesn't make a lot of sense from a, kind of the way that we're taught about story points, having an average and, you know, half the time they're, on either side of that average and it's okay. Um, in knowledge work, it's very asymmetrical, that curve. And so the midpoint is not a very good place to forecast off of, it's actually dangerous. You're, you're almost always gonna be longer than the midpoint. And so you have to start forecasting off of, uh, you know, what's really happening in your system. The question of when should, when will it be done is not answered through guesses, it's answered through analyzing delivery data. And it's, and it's improved and made reliable by managing the flow of that delivery. Most shops just pile way too much onto their teams, everything grinds to a halt, and now it's really hard to answer that question, when will it be done in any way that people like? So um, again, that's another whole huge topic uh, but that's a, as, as briefly as I can, I can answer it. Um, use real things, move away from guesses where you can. Um, guesses are probably better than nothing, uh, but they're an intermediate step to being a truly empirical uh, data-driven organization. All right, what else? I'm talking a lot. Anyone else want to come off mute? Can I talk about vertical user stories? Uh, sure. So vertical slices. Um, I like cake. <laughs> when I eat cake, I eat cake, not like I'm going to eat the top layer of frosting and then I'm going to eat the top layer of cake. I don't eat cake from the top down or the bottom up or the inside out by layer. I eat cake by a slice. I take a thin slice of that cake and I consume that slice. Uh, we want to apply that metaphor to our uh, technical uh, products as well, like when we're building things out. We don't want to say, let's design the entire persistence layer. Like if you're using a relational database, that would be a schema. Like we're going to build the entire database out and then we're going to layer on the service layer on top of that. And then we're going to layer some maybe sort of like web interface on top of that. And then we'll put user interface on top of that. Invariably, what you're going to find is that you learn things and the assumptions you had are not correct. And you're going to end up doing a bunch of rework. And the more that you have of horizontal slicing like that, the more rework you will likely incur. If you have perfect knowledge about the solution, fine, go build it. But I I have not seen that work. I don't know about any of you. Uh, we need, we don't know what that perfect answer is. We have to go discover it and you discover it through doing the work. So if we need to get feedback on something, you need to have a piece of working software out there so that people can use it. Uh, the, the school uh, poverty level metric, the, the thing that I had those user stories around, we have at the state of Maine, we got grant money, federal grant money to implement that. The, the, the solution, the product is provided by federal DOE. We just have to geocode our data according to certain business rules, geocode addresses. So we strip all of the, who, who this person is, all we have is a, a, Latin, a latitude and longitude and economic data about that latitude and longitude. So it's completely anonymized, right? So we have the addresses, we have the tool, we need to get the addresses geocoded, 
with relevant economic data and gotten up to this tool. That's the requirement. There are so many different ways we can do that. We can do that manually. We can do that individually with, with addresses. We can do that with a subset of addresses manually. We could, we could uh, write a database query that would pull all the addresses out of our a system of record and, and reformat that into a CSV. And then, you know, for like 10 bucks a month, we can subscribe to a geocoding service and upload that set of addresses to that geocoding service and it will return them with their Latin long. First, they'll validate them. Is it actually a valid address? Because not every address is valid. Can't deliver mail to it. Can't get a 911 call to it. Doesn't exist. Uh, so is it valid? And then what's its Latin long? So we can do that in so many different ways, ranging from highly manual concierge to fully automated programmatically. And the cost and delay goes up as you go along that spectrum. And we have a fixed date that we have to hit. And we have a fixed budget because it was a grant. We have some risk there that we have to mitigate. And so what I'm encouraging us to do, start with the manual thing. Like we can start that today. We don't need to ask anybody for anything. We've got a business analyst who's amazing. She can start doing that work. If we need to spend $10 a month to subscribe to some API that we can manually submit addresses to, Google will do it for free today. You just have to do it individually. Right? Those are vertical slices. It gives us optionality. It gives us trade-off. It gives us, when people say, what does Agile mean? I think it's choice. How many possible choices do you have? How many things can you respond to? Which, which directions can you pivot to based on what you learn? And if you have a lot of those, that's probably good. And if you have one of those, it's probably really risky. All right. So that's a little bit about vertical user stories. Um, talk somebody through complexity, get them to understand it. Appreciate referencing Kinevin, uh, which is how you say this Cinefin, uh, it's pronounced Kinevin framework, um, a working session workshop with, uh, reach out to me. Um, I think that's Amani, if you're still on the call. Uh, yay. Um, yeah, uh, ping me on LinkedIn or send me an email and we'll, we'll set up some time. That's oh. like one of my favorite, favorite, favorite things to talk about. So yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, that would be great. Um, what else, what other, what other questions do people have thoughts? There's another book called impact Ma mapping by Goiko Ajic. Uh, love it. Goiko Ajic is one of those people kind of like Jeff Patton, Melissa Perry. Um, when, when these people put something out or, or I see their names on a conference that I'm at, like, I will go to their session just because it's them. Like Goiko has, I've never met the guy. I don't know really anything about him. Um, except that, that I've read his books and uh, just the, the way he presents information is very, very clear and coherent and concise, and it just makes a lot of sense. So impact mapping, um, if we were to go to that product toolkit, um, is I, I put impact mapping in the definition. So it's upstream from user story mapping. Impact mapping will define, um, will, will begin defining those deliverables, and those deliverables are the things that you might want to uh, have its candidates for story mapping. So impact mapping is amazing. Just understand kind of where it fits into the overall flow of, of uh, mitigating product risk and surfacing assumption. Oh, what else? Any other questions, thoughts? Did I miss anything? The visual guide of US, you want the link to the visual guide. I can throw that in there. One moment while I go grab it. And while I'm grabbing it, if, you, if you're still here, I assume somebody's got to have a question. That will get you that PDF. I'm working on, right now, it's, it's currently a flat image. Um, I'm working on uh, making it actually have text in it so that you can like translate it into other languages if you want or run it through like a screen reader. Um, but right now, unfortunately, it is just flat, a flat graphics file, a flat PDF. Um, but I'll be updating that. What else? You're all still here. Or not. <laughs> People are like, oh, I'm leaving then. I mean, we could start talking about complexity. <laughs> 
it's always a good a good uh, conversation. One new message. Thank you. So people are dropping. Um, again, if, if no one has anything else to to say, I I think we can be uh, we can be done. We're 15 minutes into the certainly the 11 o'clock hour here on the east coast of the U.S. 15 minutes into or 45 minutes, depending on which time zone you're in. If you're in India, um, I think that's a little half an hour off of the the U.S. time zones. But um, I missed the link. PDF. There it is. If Jeff, if you're still here. Yep, Jeff's still here. Cool. Oh, I'm putting, sorry, I'm sending those messages to the uh, the waiting room. That's not helpful. So that, did you get that link, Jeff? Cool, perfect. Perfect. And and again, it's just, I'm looking for feedback. I don't have all the answers on this stuff. If you find this thing is useful, that's great. Um, it's, it came out of uh, the visual guide, came out of a thing, uh, a very early version I did maybe six years or six years ago or so. And uh, I was really excited about it. It was a little high-end drawn cartoon thing. And I sent it to Jeff, um, just cold called the guy with it. Um, he, he really liked it. And I um, and, uh, decided it had been on my, my personal backlog for years to redo it and bring it kind of more up to, to date and just kind of tighten it up and make it a little more um, informative. And so I redid it uh, in anticipation. I finally took Jeff's class last fall, his product leadership class, passionate product leadership. And, and I was super fired up to show it to him and I showed it to him and he goes, oh, that's really cool. It's another one of these. <laughs> so I guess there's like this whole ecosystem of people that are doing these kinds of guides. Um, so again, you never know what's, what's out there until you, you, sort of throw it into the market and see um, see what happens. There is kind of an interesting, another another interesting angle. We've, we've talked a little bit about risk that, that I think is really, really critical. And it's something that we don't talk enough about. Um, Dave Snowden of Kinevin uh, fame talks about this. He calls it apex predator. And apex predator theory is this idea that the, the conditions that create apex predators in ecosystems uh, the, uh, those advantages when the ecosystem or the environment changes now become liabilities. And so all of the things that enable dinosaurs, the top, like Tyrannosaurus rex and those top predators in the dinosaur realm, um, when the, the planet cooled drastically, uh, all of the things that enabled them to thrive in a very warm climate um, suddenly became very great liabilities and they, and they couldn't, they all died. <laughs> And the things that survived are surprised, very small, very efficient um, things that are not particularly well adapted yet uh, until the environment changes. And now they can um, have this amazing advantage. So that used to be a pretty theoretical concept. And then this little thing called COVID hit us. And, you know, like one organization here in Maine, uh, their entire business is uh, foreign exchange students for colleges. And they're amazing at it, amazing at it, like world renowned for how good they are at facilitating placements and getting international college students to exchange. Uh, wow, what happens when all of the things environmentally that enable that like cheap, fast, reliable, safe international travel now start spreading COVID and shuts down? Like there, it doesn't matter how good their story maps are. It doesn't matter how well they're solving the pains and gains. It doesn't matter how iterative they are, how adaptive they are, how well their options theory and complexity theory understanding is, how well they manage flow. None of it matters because the entire ecosystem that enabled them to have an existence is gone. They immediately shut down and there's no product that they could have done uh, in that point to make that a different change. I worked at a social media company in the mid 2000s, um, Facebook came out and we went in, in a year, we went from being the dominant force to being a nobody. We were able to pivot because um, we had some other internal offerings that we were able to productize quickly and get into the market, but still. Um, so there's, there's a big scary world out there It changes. 
All right, there's still a few people hanging out. Um, any any questions or anything, um, any clarifications I can make, anything that didn't quite make sense? Um, and the number is just dwindling. At some point where we've hit that, gone below that critical mass. So if, if uh, you guys are all good, maybe we call it good. And say thanks for coming out and I'll make sure Jamie gets the video. It's uh, cloud recording, so I'll, I'll do that. Um, all right. 